ChatGPT, it has been in all the headlines and it is all the rage right now for the right reasons. And I am very excited to have you guys here to speak about it because I have a lot of questions pertaining to that particular product. Uh, but before we get to all of that, please introduce yourselves. Go ahead. Yep, sure. So I'm uh, I'm Chris Jern. I am the Vice President of Emerging Technologies at CGI. Um, and what that means is actually we have a couple practices. We have a cloud computing practice as well as an AI practice, which is one of the reasons that I'm here. Uh, talk about some of the experience we have. And really what we focus on is helping organizations bring these emerging technologies in-house and deliver business value, which isn't always the easiest thing, but that's really what uh, what we do and what we love to do. Jim? Thank you. I'm Jim Arijubashi. I work in the same emerging technologies uh, group in CGI. I'm an ardent AI plus BI fan. Uh, I consider myself as a technology strategist and my work in the past for 30 years uh, spanned big compute, big data, machine learning and AI, and in general, generating insights from data. And I enjoy applying machine learning and AI in novel ways in mining, banking, finance, um, energy and uh, utilities, as well as other sectors. Perfect. It sound, I'm, again, very glad to have you guys here. Sounds like I have the right people for this discussion. Um, now, ChatGPT constantly likes to tell me that it is an AI language model. What is that? Let's start there. Oh, good. It's true in the sense that it is a language model. It is trained to, um, for example, generate um, computer language in multiple ways. Um, but it, I, I think it went beyond that uh, with the ability of using latest technologies in AI. Uh, it has uh, used a lot of different data sources and it learned using some novel ways of um, AI and BI. It learned to uh, go beyond a language model. It learned to mesh data from different sources, produce um, answers to specific questions in different areas. We might all actually experience it in uh, yeah. interacting with it. What do you think, Chris? Yeah, so like kind of breaking it down, right? So AI, people love the term, say it all the time, talk about it all the time, but what is AI? Really, you can think of it really artificial intelligence. It's using computer algorithms to simulate something, right? So it's, it's bringing intelligence to very specific tasks. And it's always the specific task is important, right? Artificial general intelligence, you can think of like, you know, the Terminator, right? That's uh, AI is coming for us. That's that's really AGI or artificial generalized intelligence. Uh, we're not there yet. Um, who knows when we'll be there? Uh, some people think it's, you know, experts around 2050 is, an, is a date that gets thrown out there, but we're definitely not there and may never get there. We haven't proven that we can get there yet. ChatGPT is an AI. It's very good at simulating language. It takes huge data sets, huge amounts of information and puts it in a way it can understand your questions and give you an answer that you can understand. And that's what was really cool about this, right? If people have played with it and used it, like being able to type in a question and get an answer that makes sense is was game changing and is game changing. And that's really what what all the what all the hype is, but also well deserved hype. Like this is it is something that needs to get the attention that it's getting. And some people say we think with using a language. So language, in a sense, a uh, required found foundation for, for the ability of think and produce ideas and thoughts, right? Yeah, yeah. So being able to produce that kind of language-related ability by chat GPT, I'm not saying it thinks, but it is probably doing a good job of simulating how to think, in a sense, maybe. Right. So... ChatGPT is not the first AI language model that's ever been introduced. Can you guys sort of speak a bit about how this all started? Um, if any of these other uh, language AI models have are being used, have been implemented, and just sort of the, I suppose, the origin story uh, of this, uh, you know, a brief history, if you will. So, one like one thing I that I you know people. To ask questions like what what is this AI thing that you do at work because it's always a, the joke like what do you, what do you really do <laughs> trying to understand that and one thing that a lot of people are really familiar with is your smart speakers right we ask a question hey Alexa hey Google hey whatever like you ask a question and it understands you and gives you an answer and that's using NLP natural language processing um, and what it's really doing is it's taking your your question that you said something aloud it translates it 
into a way that it can read it. And then it starts breaking it down. So you ask a question and it starts to understand that question in different ways. But that's not an easy thing to do. Language is really tough. It's not something that's really simple. So it started out being really bad. And I remember using these virtual assistants and they were terrible. Like, didn't even want to use it. And then just kept getting better and better because it got more data, more and more information. And it kept improving. And that's the NLPs or the natural language processing, the algorithms getting better and better. And that's like the part of the origin now it's like it's that's an oversimplified like very condensed version because like uh the large language models are different than what i'm talking about but at the same time it kind of shares a common thread um but that's really how that continued to improve and it's always people always wanted to get to being able to interact in a better way and that's where those smart speakers or chat gpt is doing a great job that you can interact with it more naturally you don't have to think and like ask a question in a very coded or like a uh, specific way, you can use your your natural language to get an answer and get it back in a way that makes sense. I think that's very true. One important aspect is definitely natural language processing. And the other aspect maybe we can say is the search engines that mm. that has been around maybe for about two decades or a little bit more maybe. The more they became more capable of getting information from different sources and then using that, inf- merging that, indexing that information to make it available for, for example, queries we enter through the text box, the more they became capable. And if you combine that with the na- natural language processing capability, probably we can say you get chat, chat GPT. <laughs> oh, very cool. So it, it sounds like it all starts with data. Um, it's funny because the last few conversations I've had uh, around operations and open banking, it always seems to come down to data. So can you guys sort of explain a bit to me on data from from your perspectives? How do you view data and how and why is it that, you know, we have trouble sorting through some of it? Like I think about some of the large banks, for instance, they have a ton of data, but they're not really able to surface insights with it. What's going on there? Chris, a big question. Would you like to take it first? Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll start. But again, it sounds like your day-to-day of why, why can't I use my data, right? <laughs> yes. Um, so let, let's take some of the large large banks or large organizations, especially organizations that have existed for a period of time. Um, just like when there's many different systems, it's not always easy to connect data together. And that's where the value starts to come is how do we connect data that exists. Um, so, you know, my, I'm a great example, you know, um, Jim, you would also be. So my name's, you know, Chris Juren, Christopher Juren. There might be a middle name in there somewhere. Is Chris Juren the same as Christopher Juren? I don't know. It'd be great if we knew that. And But the systems may have different things entered in, or it might be just C Juren. It's like these pieces of data are really hard to connect together unless it's cleaned in a, in a certain way. And that was a big limitation that existed uh, for when we talk about organizations leveraging their data because the, the the old saying garbage in garbage out that's that's always going to be there right if we don't have good data we can't create good insights so a big part of uh, AI and uh, machine learning is actually understanding your data they call it data cleaning and cleaning up the data to be able to be used in a way and this is nothing new for any analytics or uh, business intelligence this has been going on for quite some time the one of the differences is that as we moved uh, machine learning and AI, uh, you need larger data sets or that it, it benefits greatly from larger data sets. So if you want to do that kind of stuff, you need to be able to leverage that data across different spaces. So that's the always the, uh, the gold that people are looking for. How do I take my data across many different systems to be able to print, bring it together, create models to generate insights and generate value? And that's not again it's not it's not an arbitrary thing to do it's that's where the focus is and when we talk about you know why can't that happen that's one of the limitations that exists um and i brought in at the beginning larger you know organizations that are potentially older because now that we know that it's there we're building systems in a better way to be able to to surface that data in a more uh easier more robust uh architecture so that's it that's a big a big plus that exists very true and at the risk of being a, a repeating a traditional example, I'm going to just put it out there. So if I say 22, it's some piece of data, but for us, it doesn't mean much. If I say 22 degrees centigrade, now it's kind of making more sense. I, I'm talking about temperature. The 22 was the data. 22 
degree centigrade is still maybe data, but it's getting to information. If I say the temperature in this room is 22 degrees centigrade, now I, I'm talking about information. It's not raw data anymore. So it's becoming useful for us. But the next step would be maybe asking this question. Okay, so 22 degree, degrees centigrade, we feel okay. It's comfortable right now. Will it be like that for the next one hour or two hours? What will be the temperature in this room be? And in order to know that, I have to maybe take into account a lot of different variables. The, the, the heat produced by light, the heat, the temperature outside, the weather forecast, everything, maybe, because they all interact with each other. So it, it's the natural progress, actually, converting data to information and then producing insights and then adding the prediction, which is probably an, a very important element. With the advent of machine learning and AI, we have now this capability and we are eagerly applying it to very different settings. Finance and uh, wealth is, of course, one important area because it's very useful in this area and it's, it's producing a lot of very interesting results for us. Right. You know, as you were saying that, what popped into my head is you know, just portfolio management, uh, especially if I look at the current market, you know, it, we constantly have debates on is there going to be a rate rise, right? Or is the, is the central bank, are they going to raise rates? Are they going to reduce? Or are they going to leave? And then you obviously have just the, inf the crazy inflation, the general volatility that the markets experience. So I, I'm curious, like, are there any... Um, AI algorithms currently being used for portfolio construction, portfolio allocation, monitoring, et cetera. Um, and, you know, what benefit can AI add to it? What what can it help with? I know that's a very broad area sure. and I see you guys smiling about it, but I, you know, I, I think it is an interesting area to explore and to actually get real data because I my imagination runs a bit wild sometimes, but I would like to hear from the professionals if, uh, you know, I'm even in the ballpark. Sure. Oh, go ahead. Okay. So actually, when we talk about all these variables affecting our wealth management or decisions we make when managing our wealth, um, we are actually talking about systems or approaches, processes that have been in place for a long time. In the, within the technology realm, of course. Uh, it stems from actually traditional statistics. So traditionally, using classical machine learning and AI systems, we have been crunching data to predict inflation rate, to predict um, currency exchange rates, to predict, for example, real estate uh, prices. And all these variables are used in combination to produce portfolio optimization solutions because a portfolio is essentially a set of items that are put together with certain value and in order to be as successfully optimizing that port portfolio's value in the future, we have to take into account all these variables to make accurate predictions. Now, this has been around to some extent, but the challenge has been it requires a lot of data crunching. And as we all know, in the past decade or so, we have be, the, the amount of data we are producing, it has gone exponentially up. So we need new systems, more capable systems, and different, more capable approaches to crunch all this data and produce better, more accurate uh, predictions so that we can keep optimizing these portfolios, make them generate better outcomes, better better value. For sure. And go ahead. Yeah, I was going to say, like, so that's like the, the AI approach, and that's what's being used today. Like you asked, is it being used? 100% it's being used. It's that... We, we work with many different clients that are doing it today. Uh, there's really cool things you can be doing. Um, kind of one of the cool things when I look to the future of what's going to be there, that I get I get pretty excited because that's, to me, quantum computing is a huge part of what that is. So, and quantum computing is a big name, right? Like it sounds kind of, you know, what what is this quantum computing thing that we're talking about? It, but it's, you know, maybe just to, I'll just give a quick explanation of what that is. Um, so quantum computing is, you can think of like, you know, classical physics and quantum quantum uh, physics there's there's a difference between the two 
Um, you can think of like the the normal physics. You know, we we understand that we understand gravity. You drop a ball, how fast it can accelerate, nine point eight meters per second. All these different things, very easy to understand, and we can wrap our brains around it. Um, quantum starts to become something different. It's like these molecules can exist in both a wave and a particle. And it's like, what does that even mean? Like, it's really hard to wrap our heads around um, because it just doesn't, it doesn't, it, for a lot of us, it doesn't click. I'll say for me, it doesn't click very easily. It's uh, something that's a little bit different. Um, but this different states and these different things is kind of where quantum computing comes in is that regular computers, classical computers use zeros and ones. Everything we're doing here, everything going on in this room, you know, the picture on the TV can be represented as a zeros and ones. And a, um, uh, it's either on or off on a classical computer. In quantum, you have zero and one and kind of stuff in between. It's not just zeros and ones. There's this superposition, this thing in the middle. And an analogy to understand what that is, is think of like using a puzzle or let's do it. Let's, we're going to be working on a puzzle. Each one of us gets a section. We're working on one piece at a time, checking if they're going to work or not. But I don't, you know, you're working on your own. Jim's working on your own. I'm working on my own. We have to talk to figure out where pieces are and stuff like that. It's all, you know, binary type of stuff. Quantum would be able to look at all the different pieces and see if my one piece fits with any of the pieces here very quickly. And that would go a lot faster. So we can think of portfolio optimi optimization similarly, right? If I want to use, you know, five stocks or five assets in my, in my portfolio, how well is this going to perform? I have to kind of check, oh, I want to look at these. Maybe I want to look at 10. Maybe I want to look at 1,000. The combinations and permutations go so, grow so quickly to see what weighting I want to use that it becomes very hard to do the computation. Quantum does a better job of being able to take a lot of different options and kind of distill that down. So when quantum computing becomes mainstream and being able to use, be, be used even more, um, that's going to explode the uh, availability of data and the availability of options for doing uh, portfolio optimization. And it'll leverage AI models to be able to do those predictions, but it can just do more of them. And that's really where a cool part of quantum is going, going to come in. And we're not quite there yet. The number of qubits, which is different than bits, is quantum bits. Um, they're not there yet, but they will be there. And that's going to be a huge a huge uh, change in uh, in the, the the industry for for that. Quantum computing sounds very futuristic. It's like we are living in a science fiction uh, movie. But I have a related question about that great explanation. So currently, we see people already have started interacting with Chat GPT through an interface. Right now, it's mostly typing, but I'm I'm sure it will be not difficult to add a. Uh, voice processor and make it speak or listen to what we say. With the advent of quantum computing and because it sounds so complex, mm -hmm. will wealth professionals be able to interact with it directly or will there be a requirement for some kind of intermediate so that the right questions can be asked to the system so that the right answers or the relevant answers can be produced? What do you think? Yeah, that's a good question. Like, so I, know, I look at, there's a few different people who are going like, so the qu first the first question to me is, will ChatGPT be a big part of, of wealth and wealth uh, professionals? The answer is yes. Like it's, it will be there. There's a lot of different ways. I'm sure we'll touch on a couple of the different ones, but it'll be there for the wealth advisors to be able to ask questions, to be able to do things like saying, hey, summarize this information for me or go into the system and help me create tailored marketing for, you know, for Jim who based on his risk uh, profile, based on his previous history, based on, you know, different uh, clustering or different pieces that are very similar to Jim um, and get great answers that they wouldn't have been able to do before, especially if it's trained on proprietary internal data uh, on that kind of stuff, which is where where a lot of this will go because you don't want to be general. You want to be specific to be able to do that. Um, so that's going to be really cool being able to do that. And there will be wealth professionals doing that, especially as it as, as it advances. Like we're only at the beginning, right? It's been a few been a few months of time that we've been uh, been doing this kind of stuff. Um, so it'll get easier and easier to interact with. Um, and then you have the actual users, like the the, the customers that are going to be uh, needing, wanting to interact with it. And there'll be options to do that. But there, there will be a place still for people to kind of interpret results and to provide uh, input to it. And I think a lot of that will be based on the complexity. Um, it will disrupt. It will make so people, their job today will be different than what it is. And even some jobs won't exist that that are currently here um, that are, in, you know, the white color, lower, lower, uh, complexity type of jobs that it's going to get disrupted for sure. Um, 
there still will be the more complex situations that need interpretation, but that's that's the way of the world. We continue to evolve, we continue to move forward, and it's going to be the people who can harness that and understand it and leverage it that are going to be uh, kind of that intermediary that you were asking about that, that I really see needing to be there. Very interesting. Indeed. Um, now, since we are on the topic of quantum, Chris, I've heard you say the words quantum wealth, and I have been curious about what that is. So why don't we get into that? What is quantum wealth? Well, so quantum wealth, the the way that that, that I'll, I'll define it for here is um, it's, it's really leveraging the the quantum computing and the quantum technology within the wealth within the wealth space. So we, one of the examples we just gave there was uh, portfolio optimization, which again, it's the the power just is in the ability to expand what can go in and the number of different assets that we can look at. But another big one that I see with portfolio optimization is that. Right now, you know, based on current computing, the cost that exists, it may not make sense to do it for me as a as a individual investor. I'm just maybe I may don't have enough, you know, assets under management. I just I'm just not a you know a big enough fish, we'll say. But as the complexity of leveraging these new technologies goes down, that opens the door for more people to be able to use it. So that's a big uh, a big area that uh, that that I see that uh, that wealth is going to use. But there's there's other use cases that'll continue to evolve. Um, the the issue today is that the quantum computers just aren't powerful enough. So they will get more powerful, but it's just like if you think back to the original computers, right? It took an entire room on a floor and it had like all these different, uh, uh, very like large, it, 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 it was expensive and it was slow. You know, I think, uh, I forget, there was one, one of the one of the famous quotes, so you'll never need more than 500 uh, KB of RAM, things like that. Now we have like, you know, gigs and terabytes of, of RAM that people are using um, because we got better and better, made things smaller and more, more sustainable, which it currently isn't. Um, the, the just, they're not, we're not able to bring it in. So we're not seeing too, too much in quantum, but there is, it's really going to be able to, if you think of, again, any, anything that has large data sets, large uh, permutations of options is where quantum is going to make a difference. And again, AI, if it's, or machine learning, if it's really, really closely integrated with, because it allows you to be faster and cheaper. So that's where, where we're going to see, continue to see more and more evolution of it. Very true. And if I may st start uh, by giving, uh, like making an analogy, people, radio is with us for more than a hundred years, maybe. I'm not sure, but it's 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 been a long time. And and then it, TV came, then we had the internet, now we watch YouTube videos, all kinds of um, voice and um, imaging technology improved, but people still listen to radio. So I'm going to use that analogy between quantum computing and the traditional machine learning approaches. Uh, we will still have we will still use, I believe, machine learning and AI in the traditional sense. In other words, when quantum computing gets more advanced, it's not going to necessarily replace everything. But it will help a lot when it comes to, for example, better predicting um, future events to use it for, let's say, retirement planning or for tax planning or in general portfolio mm -hmm. optimization or uh, fraud detection, compliance, regulatory aspects. There are a lot of areas where traditional approaches are not enough. There, we, I believe, will be benefiting a lot from this new technology of quantum computing because just because it has the brute force, it can do things much faster and it can do crunch a lot more data in a, in a shorter time. Right. Let's talk about tax planning given that it's April, uh, tax season. Uh, so I don't know if you guys have filed your taxes, but it's something that I have been dreading this year. But I, I was thinking about, like, you know, what if AI can be used to do all that work for you so you don't have to concern yourself too much if over the year, you know, it gives you suggestions on how you budget certain things. It tells you, you know, contribute here, withdraw from there, et cetera. Um, it is... AI currently being used for tax planning? I guess my first question. And my second question is, how can it be leveraged if it's not being leveraged to the full extent as of yet? Thank you. <laughs> okay, I'll start. So it's a great question. I think it's useful when we talk about how ML and AI help may help wealth professionals in different areas if we can start by looking at how things are being done right now. Um, 
to your question, actually, I've done my tax uh, income <laughs> return and it was very boring <laughs> and time consuming <laughs> and manual. And I'm assuming, um, especially I'm an individual with a simplistic tax um, tax return, probably. I don't have too many uh, aspects like a company or, uh, or, or individuals with, with, with many investments, pro- uh, perhaps. But I imagine a wealth professional helping these kind of clients who has a more complex uh, profile, tax profile. They have to go through a lot of sources to understand the latest tax code, all those exceptions that are being applied into different unique situations. And they, of- they also have to um, absorb and understand the profile of the customer they are helping with. There might be many things uh, that apply from a tax uh, perspective. So currently, it's a very manual process. A lot of time is uh, spent for data entry, collecting data, comparing information. So in those areas, I believe, machine learning and AI has been actually utilized to some extent. For example, when I'm using um, an online tax software, behind the scenes, that software is using some kind of machine learning and it is using that to match my situation with the existing tax code to give me good good advice, to, to give me good opportunities of saving tax while staying at the same time compliant. But again, my situation might be simple compared to a lot of other um, um, people um, or companies. So with the advent of more advanced uh, machine learning and AI, imagine... Uh, the machine learning part does the work of absorbing all that tax code instead of the wealth manager going through that uh, stuff, the, autom- the, the stuff that can be automated. Imagine the machine learning and AI piece, something similar to make it maybe a quantum mm. computer or a chat GPT, absorbing information from the client by directly maybe interviewing or searching the client's online available and maybe to some extent private information hopefully with the allowance of the the client we can touch base on that there is some security concerns maybe and then it can match those results and then produce a summary or at least important points to the wealth manager or the wealth professional so that the professional can use that information spending less time on the preparation the kitchen stuff and more time on right decision making uh, relevant advice for the client and that would be actually the most impactful way of utilizing ML and AI more and more in this area. Yeah. What do you think, Chris? Yeah, like so something there like the the tax space, the tax code, that's that's a closed system. There's only so much information that you need to have. It all exists somewhere and that can be a full, you could know everything about it and that's where AI ML does an amazing job, right? If we can have something that we can truly draw a box around does a great job. And that's something that when we think about that kind of stuff, those are the types of knowledge when I'm saying like, you know, the the, the less complex knowledge areas that AI, chat GPT, different, different areas are really going to take over and make it so almost people are, are very, very limited, uh, like very limited uh, interaction with people or needing to be there. Uh, and why I say that is that if, again, you're talking about more simple returns, there may not be a need for me to have any advice outside of uh, MLAI, a system that can do all those recommendations. They can understand my my situation. It can ask me questions, you know, in a very nice way that I can understand and I can give them answers on it. Um, and it can do all my tax planning for me, potentially. There will be outside, outside cases. You know, we talked about companies, especially people that are uh, highly complex, lots of investments, lots of uh, options. You know, there can be, you know, different uh, countries involved, all those type of things that go into some of the tax planning when I think of it. Um, that you're still going to want to have the high touch, the, the information coming in. But I see it continuing in things like that. It just moving more and more away from people being involved and more to the AI or uh, programs being involved and the biggest thing is having trust in the recommendations like that's a big part that as it gets better and better people begin to trust it more right it's like the you know the you were talking about things that are you know if you and i are similar in in our return we have similar types of jobs we have similar types of situations it knows that if it gives you something it should give me something and that's very powerful that it's not just based off of one person's knowledge we can learn from all these different areas to make it even better 
for people that it wouldn't have existed before. So that's a, a huge advantage, but the disruption will continue to be there and we're going to continue to see that, that kind of stuff. And it, it will be the being able to take advantage of that. And then, like you said, to give the advice and understand it well enough to ask the right questions, to get the right advice and having uh, an advisor that can do that for you is, is a huge, huge advantage for those type of people. Right. Well, it sounds to me uh, like it, in our consulting group, we've been speaking about uh, enhancing the advisor, the advisor became more enhanced with digitization in the sense that they have all these n- new technology and tools that will aid them in better servicing their clients and spending more time on value-added activities. Uh, and, you know, you mentioned this earlier, Chris, but, you know, those like um, more like lower tier, like admin type of things that you know, most advisory teams do not enjoy doing. I was a part of that once and I didn't enjoy it either. But it, it's mostly because they don't perceive any value for the client from doing those things. So now if you can introduce AI to eliminate some of that burden and actually spend more time on the things that are important to the team and the client and better ways to service the client, uh, those are definite wins. Now, I do think there's another really interesting area here where this can be used, and that is around decumulation. And Jim, you and I, we briefly chatted about this, but the baby boomers are retiring. Um, We've been speaking about this for a while, and they've been accustomed to receiving a paycheck, right? Like many people receive their, you know, biweekly or monthly or whatever their situation is, their income uh, for that work period. And then they go out and they spend it and they live life, they use it uh, and do whatever needs to be done. But once they retire, that's no longer the case. They're not receiving that income anymore. So how do you then, uh, you know, transition them into receiving a paycheck, but now from their own sources of income, i.e. their investment accounts? Um, within our group, we have been working uh, on a tool to help address this for a while now. So it's uh, very interesting. But uh, I'm curious, do you feel that AI has the ability to play a role here? Uh, would it be able to, you know, take the tax situation, take their account situation, and obviously the life situation, kind of merge it all together, and then produce like this, you know, pretty much flawless flow of income uh, to the client. I think it's a great point. I think this is this area is one of those areas where machine learning and AI can play a significant role. In machine learning, we talk about the horizon problem. I don't want to go into too much techni- technical jargon here, but the horizon problem in a sense is the, the further you are trying to predict, the further in the future, the less successful you become because there are many things happening between now and then and the prediction accuracy goes down. So when we talk about retirement planning, for example, for many, for many people, it's something far in the future. Let me put it this way. It has to be that way. Because if you start preparing for it late, then the, the chances of being successful in that is getting lower. You have to start planning for your retirement in advance when you are young. And that means that you are trying to predict things that are going to come on your way far in the future. And this is where we have to um, utilize more machine learning, better machine learning approach, approaches. Why? Because when it comes to retirement planning, multiple variables are in play. One of them is what will, what kind of, what level of income will I need when I retire to sustain my, um, the, the, my way of life or the desired level of, um, life I want to have. The second is, what kind of additional things will happen in the marketplace affecting tax code, affecting interest rates, affecting other things that will affect my portfolio so that the portfolio, I'm talking about the portfolio I'm creating to prepare for my retirement so that it will carry me when I retire. Another aspect is, will I need long-term care? What will my health look like when I get a certain age? All these things need to be taken into account for the optimum balance I need to produce for my retirement planning. Essentially, it's also similar to portfolio optimization we have been talking about, but it has unique elements in it. And that's where I believe um, maybe some additional quantum computing or other uh, aspects come into play. What do you think, Chris? Yeah, well, one thing that, that comes into play that's a problem that we haven't really touched on yet in AI and machine learning is, is bias. 
True. Right. Like that's that's one problem, right? Is that, you know, that we we train machine learning and AI off of previous data, right? We use different different information. We we're talking about how do you collect all that data, you get lots of it, use that to predict what's going to happen. Well, there's a few things. Like one is that the data that we're using, maybe is that the right data? Do, is there biases introduced? Is is my retirement can be the same as yours, same as yours? Like that it could be totally different, but they're gonna optimize for mine. But maybe not for yours. Like that, that's a huge problem that we need to be able to correct. And it's based on the data that comes in that we do those predictions. Um, another problem that comes in also is, you know, we talked about, you know, if we're using the past to predict the future, we're we using data and potential futures. What if we can't see? Right. 2008 was a big event. You know, 2020 was another big event that people wouldn't have predicted. Like if you would have said there, I, I would have been like, that. absolutely not. No, it can't happen. Right. Like it just, it, it wasn't. It wasn't in our in our minds to be able to put that in there. It's the unknown unknowns, right? We can't predict for those. So how can we utilize that? So it'll make sure that one of the things is understanding that and being able to, like you said, you can't predict far, but you know, shorter, you don't normally, you can do a good job. But the other area is if we're not using AI, what are we using? We're just using gut intuition. We're using other people's piece of information. Like they, they may not have also known that these things were coming or being able to see it. So it's not a unique problem only to AI, but it is something we need to look at because it may not react as quickly or be able to put the brakes on as quickly as people may want to. Um, now that's a whole, that's a very loaded uh, answer just because who knows how do we put brakes on quick enough for anything like financially, like it always is tough. Um, but that's some of the things you need to take into consideration when you're looking at these. And the the cool part of, at least to me, of uh, like the, the algorithms and different things like that is that by understanding those and building it in, then it, it fixes for that. It Hopefully we can then not, we can prevent uh, repeating past mistakes, which people have a tendency not to do a great job of, right? We don't always, you know, we, we try to, but it's just, it's one of our own internal biases that, that we have. Um, and it's hard to, hard to get away from that. Um, being, bringing it in and being able to solve for that is a, is a, is a big advantage I see going on as we continue to evolve. Um, and then also just getting the data, right? As these things happen, we're going to get better and better at it. So then as we get better, things get better. So then that's a great thing that if we see the performance coming in. We're able to leverage that, that that'll continue to evolve in a more positive way that, that I see people wanting to take advantage of and needing to take advantage of. Right. Well, bias is a really important point um, because let's, well, let's go back to chat GPT for, uh, for a moment here, because that's where the uh, bias conversation has been lately. It, it's around, you know, we've seen many headlines, uh, I in the past little while where there's been criticisms of ChatGPT essentially saying that it's biased, that it doesn't represent everyone equally. So how do you sort of counter that? I guess a part of it is, could be having like a more diverse workforce, but is there other ways that you can counter bias when it comes to AI? Because obviously AI is learning off of the data sets that it's provided and the data sets to some extent, are being procured by humans. So how do you ensure that you reduce or, you know, hopefully eliminate bias? Well, if I may, <laughs> uh, I'd like to actually say something about the aspects of bias. So when we say bias, it might be related to fairness aspect, as we all understand during our daily life. But from also a statistical perspective, bias uh, means something slightly different. It also means the bias in your data or the bias of how you use your data to make, to make certain decisions. For example, if I collect data uh, specifically from certain sources and ignore some other sources, my data becomes biased. And the decisions I will make based on that data will have to be biased. Another as, an, an analogy could be like this. I'm an investment professional, professional, wealth professional, and I'm advising one of my clients to put together a retirement portfolio. And I'm biased towards certain investment elements. Maybe I'm a gold bug or maybe I'm a technology person and I specifically advise based on using these um, investment um, tools. Now, Chris, you mentioned there are black swans coming, in the, coming always mm -hmm. from time to time. There are events that are unpredictable. How can I make sure I'm prepared for those? I have to I have to prepare a balanced portfolio with proper hedges in place. And my bias, 
either introduced through the select, selective bias coming from that data or the biases I have regarding favoring certain investment tools over others, that would make me prone to uh, or vulnerable to that kind of uh, black swan events. Why? Because if I make my portfolio 80% certain technology stocks, what if that black swan event makes those technology sto stocks go down, my entire portfolio uh, will go down with it. So in order to eliminate bias in this sense, we and in order to make a balanced approach with proper hedges in place, we have to use much uh, data coming from many more resources, not limited to a certain resource. And that requires, again, uh, crunching a lot, of, a lot more data. And we have to create much more sophisticated algorithms because a simplistic algorithm will always almost always deviate towards a certain biased uh, form of decision making yeah like when i when i think of bias like there's two things that come to my mind like one is like the 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 area of ethical ai and then also explainable ai those are two things that always come up in that so ethical ai you touched on like the fairness the having the 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 recommendations being based off of good data that's hopefully as unbiased as possible um and then ways to eliminate bias is a big part of what what we're looking at how we can do that um but the, your question initially was you know is there bias there yes like that that you could you could answer it very quickly on just that now are people trying to improve it of course you can say the same to people like do we have cognitive biases in our mind of course we do right people have heard of anchoring and different is like tons of these different cognitive biases that every single person has and there's no no way around having them but one of the things that's really really interesting in that um you know it depends on if you uh like uh the, I, I love the book thinking fast and slow talks about our you know system one system two really quick responses versus if we take a step back and actually think about them we can try to overcome some of those bias so we try to do that with within AI and within machine learning to recognize bias and remove bias. So we're always trying to do that. It's not an easy process. It's not something that just happens overnight. Um, and ChatGPT is very, very early on. So it's going to have more and more of this. Um, and we will be able to try to remove most of it. You never get all of it gone because also who defines bias, who defines that? There's always going to be different uh, opinions on what that is. Um, so that's one way is like looking at, you know, the data, the recommendations, how can we improve there? The other part is explainable AI. So what is ex explainable AI is if, uh, you know, for loan origination, if we're using AI to say yes or no to loans for people, the AI may say yes. And then we say, okay, why? And sometimes there's these different, uh, uh, like, uh, like deep learning, deep neural networks and these things that are not understandable. So what that means is that if I say why, we can... I don't know. That's that's literally like just don't know. It's now there's ways to get around doing that, but not all AI is explainable, and that may not be acceptable, right? We may not be able to have that, right? We we were you know chatting a little bit before about some of the legal late legal side of that, right? If I'm in court and the the AI judge says guilty, I'm probably going to say why, right? Like give me give me a good reason. Sorry, just that's what that's what the network said. Like no, that will that won't be acceptable. And having explainable AI helps to do that because then you can understand where the reasoning came from where the recommendation came from so then you can start to say okay where where might this be a little bit incorrect if we don't if the answers are not what they should be um and then another thing is just putting like we, we talk about the human in the loop where ai is creating recommendations to a person to make a decision and it helps because it can generate insights that we would have never got on our own right there's too much data we can't know everything so it generates these insights for us but we decide what's going to happen there we still have the personal bias that's a problem there, but you can start to recognize and eliminate uh, the different biases in, in the models and things like that. So there's some ways that we can get around it. It's just the problem is it's not easy. It's not it's not uh, uh, cheap to do. And you were talking about simplicity versus uh, com complexity. Like we like simple things. We like things that get done, right? I, I started out by saying we look at solutions that can deliver business value. Sometimes time to market's a uh, business value. But then we have to understand what the implications of that are. And those are different decision criteria, evaluation criteria that we make whenever we're doing this type of work. Right. Well, perhaps ChatGPT4 will be able to solve this issue because as we know, it's which, you know, and we can discuss this, I 
personally, when it comes to ChatGPT, I instantly fell in love with it. And then very shortly after, I started becoming horrified. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it, it got it got a bit scary with, you know, just how good it was. And and it continuously improves. So now we have news that ChatGPT4 uh, is is out there in you know some forms of beta testing, and it's been given access with its own code. It has a budget. So when I hear that, it sounds to me like it's been given autonomy. Now, is that accurate to say? And you know, will it be able to solve? If it is given autonomy, can it solve some of the issues that we're currently experiencing with ChatGPT3? Yeah, so GP, the, the chat GPTs, it's built off of GPT-3.5, 3, 3 and they've just, they're releasing GPT-4, which is what you're talking about. And it's, it's wild. Like it's, 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 it's pretty good. Like we were talking about some of the, some of the benchmarks that are out there. Um, some of the ones that I found that, that either fascinated or scared me, depending on the, <laughs> the level that it's at there. Um, one, like the, the writing the LSAT. Yeah, it, it passes it, but it's in like the top 88th percentile. Like it's, it's pretty smart. The SAT for the math, the math answers, like it's, it's giving great answers there. Um, you know, near and dear to, to my heart being a, a computer scientist and like being there that it's doing uh, like, uh, like coding challenges and the easy, it's getting almost all of them. The medium, it's getting most of them and the hard is starting to get versus 3.5. It was much lower. So four has gotten much better. Like we can see a drastic increase in the performance of it. So that means it's going to give better answers. It's going to give better outcomes. It's going to create better code. It's going to do all that kind of stuff in a better way. So giving ChatGPT access to its, itself and to do these type of things, and we talked about you know budget, really that's about how much time and effort it can spend on it because you don't want it to be unlimited because you know computers never sleep. Right. If it just keeps going and keeps racking up a bill, maybe it may not be uh, the right the right thing to do be before you test outcomes and give it feedback on that. Um, but if like in my opinion, like if you know ChatGPT off GPT three point five was to write itself, it wouldn't be anywhere near what it is. The people OpenAI did a, an amazing job. They've done some really cool stuff um, that we hadn't seen before, and they created things they they invented they had insights and and learnings that just were never there before and bringing it together and that's still we're not we're not quite there with ai being able to do that and that's when we we're talking at the beginning that artificial generalized intelligence is the true intelligence where ai is as smart as us on novel things that it hasn't been trained to do before so that's one of the things like being trained to do before means that you're giving it a specific thing which is what ai does right now um as it improves, it, it could find improvements though, right? We were talking about there's things that we may not see when we go and do it. It could go in and say, oh, you know what? Hey, you messed up here. You know, oh, I found some bias. Like maybe maybe it can do that kind of stuff and it will improve things that we didn't see. The problem is that if it does things incorrectly, right? I don't know if people have heard the uh, G chat GPT creates um, its own facts. They call it hallucinating, where if you ask it to plan a trip, it'll say, oh, stay in this hotel and the hotel doesn't exist. <laughs> it's like that's kind of weird now we have to be careful with that right like that's one of the, the problems that still exists there they're trying again trying to remove it we're recognizing it and removing it from there but it may make changes that are just wrong and that's there's ways around like having like you know uh, uh code reviews and different things that we we have today like we do already with people so we can do similar things to try and improve it but there will be limitations to what it can do uh will it improve itself i'm sure there'll be improvements made by doing that i don't think it'll be quite the jumps that we're seeing that we saw from the beginning and we will see from that. But as the improvements happen, the improvements are going to happen. Like that's, we're getting, getting into that, that cycle of, uh, of, of speed and, uh, accuracy and improvement that just don't exist without, with, uh, with just people doing it. Well, I think the hallucinations can be attributed to, it, it very clearly always tells that it's, uh, knowledge cutoff is in 2021. So perhaps that hotel did exist in 2021 and it just doesn't exist anymore. But, uh, yeah, no, I, I, I think it's really interesting. And it's funny because I actually asked ChatGPT to give me a few questions to ask <laughs> <laughs> during a conversation about ChatGPT. And I was very impressed because one of the ones they came out with was what are some of the ethical implications of using ChatGPT? Um, so I will throw it to you guys. What do you see as some of the ethical implications? Very important indeed. I think we have never have had something quite similar to ChatGPT or probably what's coming after that, you mentioned artificial general AI. So we are in uncharted waters when it comes to that. We just don't know 
But the fact that people are asking these questions or raising these concerns regarding ethics, um, safety, uh, that gives me some level of comfort because that's the probably most basic safety measure we might have. And with that drive, we might be able to, we should actually um, um, apply certain uh, measures so that it doesn't go wild or it doesn't get out of control. Having said that, I also have some more practical and problems of today when it comes to using chat GPT like systems. For example, again, I'm going to make an analogy. I'm a wealth professional. I'm using chat GPT or the next thing, quantum computing. It's a single program running somewhere in the cloud, probably. And I'm providing advice or performing portfolio optimization for one of my clients. Somewhere in another place on the planet, another wealth advisor is working with another client, but they are both interacting with the same entity, assuming they are using the same chat GPT or the quantum computing. So what prevents one person's private information leaking through the system and goes to the other person? And there might be some actors who might want to take advantage of this kind of situation. I ask this question to myself. We dis we've discussed <laughs> yes. this in our private conversation. So then maybe I can turn to you. What do you think, Chris? What, what are some of the practical problems as you uh, raised? And yeah. then how can we deal with them? Well, so data leak is a problem, right? We, we hear about it all the time. Different someone else is on in the news for leaking of data. Well, what if what if these searches and these results get leaked, right? Like, what are the implications there? What if I'm asking questions to ChatGPT and maybe they weren't the most most ethical questions? Could those be used against me? Like it's a it's a question that's there and from uh, companies and things like that, like asking different questions around things that we may not want to be out there, right? Like it's 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 a very it's a very dangerous situation that that could happen. Um, yeah, and it it we're, we're they're trying to prevent that from happening, of course. But just like anything, you you're only as good until you find the exploit and then. It gets exploited and then you close it and it's a it's an arms race, right? Of trying to to do that. And then also using bad actors is another thing, right? Like what if I'm what if I'm able to get in there and create outcomes that are more beneficial for me that may not be beneficial for everyone. So like the the answers aren't aren't what we need them to be. Um those are those are definite definite problems that we need to 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 find on that. Um there's there's definitely security measures that can be put in place by putting you know walls up and not having not sharing all data across, making it harder to happen. There's no no security is perfect. You know there's no no fortresses impenetrable impenetrable. Like there's no no perfect solution to anything. There are things we can do to mitigate risk, but the risks are always going to exist. And the more we put ourselves into the digital world, the more risks, uh, the easier it is to have those have massive data leaks and ma massive data data exploits come out. So I think that that's that's a big a big problem that that is just going to be there, and that there we'll continue to put walls up and be have to be smart by doing it, not just trying to be quick. Um, but that that's going to be there uh, for sure. And was that were, were any of the other ones on your mind? Another practical pro uh, question I have in mind is again I'm going to use the same analogy, and uh, uh, the the situation is again two wealth managers are working with two different clients actually many wealth managers this time working with many clients and they are using the same system now they are asking the system what to put in the portfolio and based on the trends the system identifies and based on actually more and more people are using the same investment item the system might start advising the same investment item to all these wealth professionals now we have everyone on the same side of the trade Mm -hmm. And that creates a dangerous situation because we've talked about we've talked about black swans and yep. all kind of market yep. uh, unique market events. So this can be something unpredictable. Actually, there is no harm in it. No, nothing is against rules or laws. It's just that the system, by just interacting with um, people who are using it, makes recommendations, and those recommendations gets again biased. So how do we, for example, handle this type of problem? Yeah, for sure. So and, and it, it's going to be something that's there. And how do we how do we have the right the right diversity of of investment and encouraging that and rewarding that? Um, a few things will happen, right? I'm sure there will be too much on one side versus the other, and then there'll be a crash, and then people will 
we'll do that. As we we learn from mistakes. It's it's a sad thing that we have to have mistakes in order to learn. I think that's going to be a big a big way that I would see that that coming in. Um, one one other thing that you know you're asking about some of the risks that are there. One of the risks that I see, and that's uh, something that's always top of mind to me, is that you know are what it will this create more disparity between you know different classes of people, the, the richest people getting access to these type of things with the most money, with the most investments, getting the best, you know, in, in, uh, advisement of information versus people that may not be there. Is that going to be the top product that you have to have X million under uh, assets under management in order to get even access to these things to try and bring people in? Eventually it'll go, like it'll always, like kind of not always, but it'll start to even out. But there is a big problem with the availability of resources being put to the people who are most well off now and then taking advantage of becoming more well off and the people not being able to catch up with that. And that's another big problem that's being talked about in the industry is how do we uh, try to prevent that inequality that that is there and we've seen in the past. So how do we prevent that while still having a capital market, while still allowing for companies to have freedom to do work to make money? Like it's a very difficult, it's a little bit outside of the AI wealth chat type of thing, but that's something that is top of mind for people creating these uh, solutions is how do we ensure that we can do these type of things and reward the right behaviors around it? Right. Well, you said something, Chris, that reminded me of an episode of like Black Mirror almost, and we were talking about that earlier, but this idea that we become so dependent on chat GPT and then that becomes your go-to place, right? So you enter something there and maybe you're just curious because like, it can't read your brain, but you ask it a question that's considered unethical and now there's a black mark against you with, oh, you know, this person, you know, might think this way or have these thoughts because they asked this inquiry and it could be, you know, something very innocent, but again, it does not know your intentions. When I look at chat GPT, especially, uh, with it being integrated with search engines, I find that really concerning um, because it goes back to that bias point. Um, and also, I suppose, a bit of human nature where it seems like we're always looking for shortcuts and convenience. And sometimes the long road is better. The, the, the journey that you go on to, you know, figure certain things out and learn is beneficial for you. And one of my fears is that we're going to lose that. Um, you know, I myself, like I lead research uh, for our group. But, you know, I've noticed that I even whenever I have something new that I've started on, I'll go to chat GPT and I'll ask it, hey, you know, tell me a bit about this or tell me about the players in this industry. Where before, you know, I would perhaps start off with the generalized Google list. Now I'm using it as a starting point and then I go back and further my research. But I am concerned, like, you know, what if one day I, you know, I fall to the trap of just convenience and and I no longer do the due diligence that's required. And I feel that that is something that we need to look at and, you know, yes, create systems that give you accurate information, but also just find ways of preserving curiosity, I'll say, right? Because if you just have everything at your fingertips, it, you, you sort of lose a certain drive for life almost. So how do we prevent that? But we're, we're already there for a lot of things, right? Like I can't, I, I can barely tell you anyone's phone number. <laughs> yes. Right. Like, I, like why, 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 why would you remember that? I got my phone. Like it's, it's right here. Right. Or, you know, when's the last time you picked up an encyclopedia? No, it's on Wikipedia. It's on Google. Like, you know, people, people leverage that. So it's, a lot of it is going to be out of convenience, but it's also going to be the the, the scary part of that is, is as it gets better and better, there'll be no reason to go away from it. Why, why wouldn't I let AI give me my answer? It's give me a better answer. Where, where it's going to go, though, is, is memorizing phone numbers really that important? Is that really the most important part of my brain? Or is it to hopefully free up time to do more intelligent things, more uh, creative things, to do different, different pieces of information that might be better to be able to use? Um, in, in that way. So that's where I still see that um, where we are now, where where AI is, it still isn't the the truly, uh, truly intelligent, truly creative, never been done before, different things that are that are there, like stitching it together that we need to continue to reward in society, right? Like there's the like DALI 2, which creates the, the pictures by you put a prompt in, it creates a picture for you. Really cool. Um, but it still hasn't taken away from there being a need for art 
and for people to do that kind of stuff. So from a creativity standpoint, you still need to go and take information. You might be able to get it faster. You might be able to get it easier. You hopefully will not only take it from one source, because one source is probably one of the worst things you can do from a bias standpoint. There, you're going to be able to have, and we, we need to have more competition in this space, uh, which we which we will, because that's the way that the, the markets will, will work. But by taking information from multiple places and making drawing conclusions for yourself, It'll be those types of problems that'll still be rewarded. The things that are, you know, closed systems that are information that is that yes or no answers, not well, it depends. Then that the the yes or no answers we can get, right? We can get a date, we can get a time, we can get an amount. Those are all okay to get from there. But getting things that are maybe that are like an opinion, the greatest player of all time, all these different things, these are things that we will still always have, in my opinion, that it'll continue to go. We just will get better data and more data to support those decisions. Right. And and that makes sense. It is true. We don't memorize phone numbers. And then you lose your phone and you panic and you're like, oh no, who do I call? It's in the cloud. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. But but uh, the cloud's also, you know, sort of a, a new invention that's, that has been very helpful because now if, you know, you're PC breaks down for whatever reason, you don't have to worry about losing everything. It's stored somewhere else and you can go and retrieve it. Uh, so I, I think that's a really interesting area. Now, if we sort of go back a bit to chat GPT-4 um, and it's, you know, what I'll call new powers <laughs> that's been essentially granted and all the things that it's going to do. Can you speak a bit about like some of the main differences between three point chat GPT 3.5 and four. Like I know there's major improvements, but like what are some of the main differences and how can those differences be utilized? So like I think about, for instance, coders, right? Like I tried to get chat GPT to create code for me and it was able to create some strings and then it ran into issues with others. Um, just how big of an improvement is there between ChatGPT 3.5 and 4? Yeah, a lot. <laughs> it, it, it really is. Like, and I, I hit on a couple of them a little bit earlier, but the ones that the, the, the standardized test is still where people are, are, are trying to, to look at it. Um, so there's some I talked about, you know, the LSAT, it, the comparison. I just said, like, what it can do, but it, before, it, it's greatly uh, improved the coding um, on coding problems. Again, it's, that's one way that we use a uh, leak code is a pretty famous place where people will do coding challenges and things like that to just see how good of a, a developer or a coder you are. It's gone from, um, uh, thinking I'm doing some things off the top of my head, so I don't have the, the ones in front of me, but, you know, some of the easy, a few of the medium and none of the hard, because they, they do, you know, easy, medium, hard to most of the easy, a good amount of the medium and some of the hard. So it's improved. And these are, these are not simple problems that it, that it's solving. But that's what it's being trained to do, right? It's being trained to improve. It's being trained on certain things. Um, answers that uh, almost like you're trying to trick it, where you ask it things about an American singer who did this and this, and it's uh, the answer that it gives you is Elvis Presley. Now it knows that it's not uh, Elvis <laughs> Presley. It's a different Elvis. Like it, there's different examples of how it's improved. And it's kind of going back to some of that bias thing that we were talking about, where we recognize the problem, we recognize failures, and then we improve upon it. And it's whatever, it's the known known problems that are there. The unknown problems, it'll still continue to, we'll find them and we'll, we'll improve on them. But what it just means is that as answers get better, as they become more understandable, and as we trust them more, that it's going to be leveraged even more by people. And then as it gets leveraged even more, it gets even more data, which means that it'll get better from that, and it's it's a it's a spiral that we go into. You could either go you know up or down depending on how you think the spiral is, but it it'll continue to improve, and that just means it opens up new use cases that were not there before. Well, we may not have trusted it to like we said to to co to do to do development for different pieces. It maybe maybe you will trust it. Um, it still isn't doing super complex development that we want to trust the the architecture and like the kind of the, the the bare bones the infrastructure of it to to be able to do like good uh good work and i won't go into like the the principles of software development but it, it's not it's not doing that just yet but will it at some point maybe once it does that what does that mean for for the industry will we will we believe that that's that's okay right uh, Microsoft partnered with uh, OpenAI, um, and they're talking about Copilot for the different Office Suite products to be able to leverage it to improve your emails, to improve your Word docs. Like that's kind of scary too when we talk about bias and different things, but it's also kind of cool from a speed and timeline standpoint. So having these 
these helpers is going to improve and open up the potential use cases, but also could potentially close down the number of opportunities that people have that aren't leveraging it and that 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 aren't there. So it's a it will be a double edged sword, but it'll be about how do you stay ahead and be useful in that industry, right? Hundred years ago does not look like today. Jobs that didn't exist, and I the, we see those lists sometimes, right? Of all the different jobs that ex, that example. I think we were actually we were we were chatting around like the the lamp lighters uh, that <laughs> yes. did that kind of stuff, right? Like really, that that was a thing. It's like I it's it's hard to imagine that people would deliver ice to to your house or deliver milk, and it's just like did that's what people were doing. But now we don't we don't have that. We have different jobs that are available. Right. I, I wouldn't be able to explain what I did to someone to my, you know, to my grandmother growing up. She wouldn't like like I, I don't understand cloud. What what is what is this cloud and AI thing you're talking about? But we adapt to it, we bring on the opportunities to do that. But as it improves, it's just it's it's going to continue to accelerate is the the scary and exciting part of it. Definitely. Well, okay, so that is another area of concern, I suppose I'll say, which, you know, it is passing the LSATs. Uh, it's passing some of the accounting, a lot of the accounting tests as well. So I suppose there, there's two ways we can go. It can either be used to enhance, let's say, lawyers and accountants, or it can replace them. And I think as per with anything, there'll be a happy medium where it might take away some of the clerical work, you know, some of the very manual and administrative work. But, you know, as you pointed out earlier, it doesn't have all that creativity. It doesn't really think on its own. It's no Harvey Specter. You know, we're always going to need uh, certain lawyers uh, to be out there. But th- this is a gym, a really good area to look at when it comes to how technology is affecting people, right? Um, when you talk about a people, a person's job, for instance, that's their livelihood. So how do we get people ready for this new era of technology? I think that's probably the biggest question everyone is uh, thinking about. So if we look at if we look at the progress of, progress of technology in different areas in our history, actually we see that whenever there is a new technology coming in, at first it accelerates, and then after a while it reaches a plateau. People talk about a singularity, a, 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 a computer computerized AI that is a runaway process. It will get more clever and more clever, and eventually it will get wipe out everything. I don't believe that scenario. We had cars invented first, and then they improved very fast at the beginning. Now, for the past several decades, cars look more or less the same. Same applies to computer processors. At first, every year there was a new processor, new type of more powerful computer, but nowadays our laptops are more or less the same. If when, Wherever we look at, we don't see that runaway process. I believe main reason behind that is there are foundational limits, physical limits that universe opposes on different things, physical limits that we cannot uh, go around. Yes, we can improve quantum computing. Yes, we can improve artificial uh, intelligence. But at certain at a certain point, it, the improvement cannot go exponentially. And having said that, that's what I think will uh, happen. So these improvements will be going wild for a while probably some people will have to um, change how they do things some people will see that as a big opportunity and will use these new improvements to replace some uh, basic tasks tasks that can be automated and then they will switch to new areas you mentioned about creativity they will use the actually this kind of improvement will force people to use their creativity in novel areas and then that will be beneficial for the entire society F- from a wealth management perspective wealth professionals will have more time assessing different options and making better informed decisions and making more valuable advice to their clients compared to spending 80 percent of their time just going through tax code or regulatory code or compliance related stuff or security related stuff that can be handled by the by the new machine learning and AI realm, and then they can be more valuable for themselves, for the company they work, and for their clients. This applies to, I believe, every every aspect of our society. What do you think, Chris? So I I, I do see that it's, it, it's already started to be somewhat disruptive, and it's going to be even more disruptive, right? You talked about how that you know hits a plateau. We're we're obviously not there. It's just kind of getting getting to there. 
Um, and it will disrupt many industries and many professions, many jobs, for sure. Like, I, I think that that's a very, very likely, and we've already started to see some of that. Um, where there's always going to be, you know, difficulty is the human aspect, right? The human interaction, person to person, uh, true, true empathy. If you ask ChatGPT if it has empathy, it'll kind of say no. And if you ask it empathetic questions, it does a pretty good job of giving answers. But those are, you know, kind of pre-programmed or like they're based off of other other pieces. But the types of jobs that require, like we said, creativity, people, uh, people skills, uh, emotional intelligence, all those type of things um, will still be there and will will create new ones that we never even knew existed before that that'll the society will continue to evolve into that and for people that want to be you know none of us want to be left behind none of us want to to be you know to feel like we were not we're not needed it'll be people who are able to identify that and kind of continue to evolve into those spaces that i think is going to be super important for people to uh to to be able to do and that that's the people who be successful um recognizing that and being uh the type of person who wants to learn who wants to continue to evolve it's hard for some it's easy for others and there's no one type of person who that that always goes to um but it, it'll be about doing that and then also the support systems that are there how do we you know go all the way back to the what we what we learn what we teach what we reward um for people to be able to do that and how do we help others to do that kind of stuff is very important like it's not it's not just an uh, altruistic thing that we do but we need to be able to 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 focus in on that and and find ways to do it even within our our own you know jobs like it's not just a whole societal thing but how do we do it within our day to day ourselves are the people that we that we support that we're leaders around and our and our leaders to do that and uh, demand that of them so i think it's going to be important to continue to do that right well we do need to wrap up soon but before we go so Chris, earlier you mentioned the Terminator, and I have to know, how far away are we from that? <laughs> um, so we were talking about the singularity, artificial general yeah, the, intelligence. Yeah, the artificial general yeah. intelligence. So um, the the last number that I heard, uh, and there's no there's no right answer, right? Some people say it's coming coming tomorrow. Some people say you know like it's very very close. Some people say we'll never have it ever. Like just it's not possible. Like Jim was talking about uh, universal limits. There are people who truly believe in experts who truly believe that they're, that they'll never, they're not, it's not going to happen. Um, a common answer when they take the average from some of the industry experts, um, 2052 was a number that was recently thrown around, which is, you know, getting, getting close. <laughs> I, you know, the, the, the nineties aren't that, that far away for, for some of us. And, uh, you know, 30 years from now is not that far away for, for some of us. So that's a, that's a potential answer. Um, but, Again, will it be, you know, we talk about the the Terminator and the 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 robots going against us and all that. We don't know what the future will be, right? It could be great. It could be terrible. There could be other um, forces that will, you know, have an even bigger impact on our lives that we don't even know about or that we know about today. Um, but it really comes down to when when is it going to be? It's I, I don't think it's just going to be an explosion like one day it just kind of happens. I think we'll be able to continue to see these the, this evolution and better and better. And there will be guardrails put in place. They won't always be respected and they will have issues that'll come in. Um, but it it is something that that is, you know, in my opinion, it, it will happen. Um, we will get to AGI, but um, the, the timeline is I, I'm, I, I don't know. Like that, I'm not, uh, you know, that, that's not something that I, I really know when it's going to be. But it, it's as we continue to see this evolution, thinking back 10 years ago, like AI and ML is just, it, it's amazing the progress that has been made and that we see in our in our daily lives you'd be surprised how much uh, ai is out there that that we're using um and it'll just continue to go that way and we'll, we'll have to be ready for it and continue to adapt with it absolutely well hopefully it, it'll be a uh, good story and that we you know the robots will not take over um but we do need to wrap up before we go uh do either of you have any final thoughts that you would like to share I only want to add uh, that Mary Curie spent a life and probably lost her life for her research of finding radioactivity. And then that radioactivity has been used for good and bad pur purposes. We use it for, for example, better health, better treatments. We can use it for other things we, uh, terrible to even think about. If it happens so that this AI machine learning, artificial general, whatever we want to call it. If it happens so that it becomes very powerful, I on, I, my only hope is it will be 
beneficial to the society we live in. Maybe I won't see it, maybe I will, but I hope I only hope our kids will benefit from it. Yeah. And again, I, I kind of echo what you're saying. Like I think it's it's very important that the people who are creating the future take care of the people who the future or will inherit the future. It's very important that we have that mindset and that we find ways to do that across many different uh, things, including AI, including lots of different uh, pieces that we, we see change happening. But it is on the leaders and, you know, people who are out there. We, we don't always recognize who the leaders are, but there are many people who don't, don't maybe not thinking that they're leaders, that they're the ones who are doing this type of work. And it's on, on them to do that um, and, and to keep that mindset of how do I improve? How do I create a better world? Because we have the opportunity to continue to do that and to take advantage of things that are there leverage it for our professional lives, our personal lives, just our lives in general. And that's, it's a very powerful thing that we're being given. And, you know, with great power comes great responsibility. So we have to do those type of things. Absolutely. Well, thank you both. This has been a very insightful conversation. I've learned a lot and I'm uh, glad you guys came out to chat with me. Thank you very much. Thank you. If you enjoyed this episode, please be sure to share, like, and subscribe and we'll catch you at the next one.